and recording has started. Welcome everyone. It's 101. Uh, we're starting our CSBARS meeting for April. So first and foremost, welcome and hopefully everyone will be joining us shortly. Could we do our roll call, please? Certainly. Jay Frickberg. Present. Jessica Park. I think you may be on mute. Okay. Present. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, George Leo. Present. Linda Keller. Present. Michael Clancy. Present. Paul Kramer. Present. Greg Murphy. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, next will be our request for public comment. And again, public comment may be limited to two minutes. We haven't had that issue with the CSBARS. Uh, we'll see if that happens today. Um, also, the advice public comment can be submitted in writing. That is always preferable if possible for everyone. And if you are calling on your telephone versus using the Zoom app on your computer, you can press star nine on your phone to indicate you wish to make a public comment and raising your hand. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Chair, we do have one public commenter. I will uh, I will recognize Pete uh, to allow to talk uh, for two minutes. Thank you. Greetings, my name is Pete Bennett from Contra Costa County. I have litigation history going back to the early 80s. I have suffered immense losses, not something to be looked past. In my blog, Bennett vs Southern Pacific.com, and my other blog, Contra Costa Bar Association.com, and another one called Oracle v PeopleSoft.com. I worked on the Oracle project for the defense team. A year after that project, I was in the hospital dying from poison, kidney failure, covered up by District Attorney Mark Peterson, who was disbarred at the efforts that I brought the California Department of Justice in on. I have been beaten. My children have been taken. My cars have been consistently stolen or towed away. Endless tickets to the tune of 50 grand my attorney was beaten up in Bennett versus Collins. Mr. Collins is dead. In Bennett versus Southern Pacific, Floyd Brown Jr. is dead and can't be found. The state bar has failed me so miserably. The attorneys in Contra Costa County, round robin, no, you don't have a case. No, you don't have a case. I'm also the federal witness against PG&E, PG&E witness.com. I have been beaten out of millions of dollars. I'm not going to die while the attorneys sit back and the district attorneys sit back and the investigators lay on their tail. My attorney was Mark Angelucci, gunned down and killed. Is that not information for you to act? My story interweaves with all the major firms or interwoven, excuse me. Munger, Tulls, and Olson went to went and settled with Butte County, not, 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 not knowing. Mr. Bennett, you know, Mr. Bennett your time just, has expired. Open, and for oh. the other members oh, um, yes. on site, okay. perhaps mute your phone. We might hear people <laughs> additional outside noise. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Bennett. Uh, there are no further public comments. Ms. Leonard. And welcome Ms. to Mr. Leonard. Murphy. Uh, yes, I'm sorry I'm a few minutes late. It's 2.06 Mountain Time. Uh, I want to let you know that uh, I'm here in the room that CS Bar is reserved for me at the Billings Public Library. It's open to the public. There are no members of the public here uh, interested in making a comment. Thank you for that clarification and appreciate your report. 
as there are no additional public comments indicating indicated, uh, we'd like to thank the public for the comment that we have received. And Mr. Fickford, uh, Mr. Bennett. Hmm? Uh, Chair Fickford, before we proceed, um, there were several things going on at once when Mr. Bennett concluded his comment. Um, he did have approximately 10 seconds. He has raised his hand again. May we raise, um, may, may we recognize Mr. Bennett for 10 more seconds? Of course. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bennett, you're recognized for an additional 10 seconds if you choose to do so. The bottom line, the bottom line is I will be killed in order to cover up what's going on in Contra Costa County. Act quickly, decisively. That's what I need is SOS. I'm tired of asking. I've been going through this for 40 years. Okay. Thank you. I apologize for the sound, but thank you, Mr. Bennett. And again, as there is no additional public comment indicated, thank you for the public comment that we have received. And if we can return Mr. Bennett to the attendees, that would be appreciated. Our next item is our approval minutes from March 18th. The minutes have been circulated prior by posting uh, to our agenda. Is there any additional time needed for review from our committee members? If so, please indicate. Uh, Chair Frickberg, this is uh, Greg Murphy. I don't uh, have the facility with the device I'm using here to look at them, but I was uh, late to the last meeting, uh, <clears throat> but was present for uh, the, subs the substance of the discussion. So Thank I just you. like that. I don't know whether the minutes reflect that I was present or not, but I did attend. I will verify. And Mr. Murphy, would you like a copy of those minutes emailed to you? Um, no, that's okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So at this time, is there a motion to adopt or is there a further discussion to correct any changes or deficiencies in the proposed minutes from our committee? Motion to approve. Seconded by Michael Clancy. As it's been moved and seconded, can we have a roll call vote to adopt as it is, please? Yes. Uh, Paul Kramer? Yes. Michael Clancy? Yes. Linda Keller? Yes. Greg Murphy? Yes. George Leal? Yes. Jessica Park. Yes. And uh, Jay Frickberg. Hi. The motion carries. Thank you. We are now coming up to part B, uh, staff report. Uh, Ms. Leonard, would you like to take over this portion? Just a moment, I'm having an unruly cell phone. Okay, <laughs> with the timer. I appreciate that. I apologize. So um, I'd like to take a moment to talk about the reporting forms for uh, the minimum cumulative uh, five-year bar exam pass rate that the accredited schools will be reporting. Uh, before the CS bars convenes again in June, those forms will issue. They are scheduled to issue during the week that the February uh, 2022 bar exam results release. Uh, based on feedback from this committee at CS bars, the attestations on the forms will be different. They will correctly reflect that the law school deans have available to them the pass fail reports and will be verifying the counts as to those listed on the pass fail reports and that they will then further have applied the numerical calculations uh, that are requested by the state bar to reflect those individuals that are participating in or who have completed the, the alternative pathway to licensure. Uh, that latter portion uh, was not included in last year's reporting, though the reporting um, did reflect that and all of the reporting figures were correct. 
um, by providing a numerical adjustment as to those who choose the alternative pathway, uh, we keep another commitment made to the public and the law schools that those who choose the alternative pathway to licensure will not be treated any differently than those who license uh, by passing a bar exam and uh, their identities will not be otherwise identified separately. Um, for those who need to turn in the forms, the deadline remains the same and on July 1st. The calculations do remain the same July 1st. To the extent that schools are able to turn in their calculations sooner, um, since this was all originally corrected, we now release reports, uh, score reports somewhat sooner. And to the extent that the schools can release their figures back to us once they get the forms, it will help us to provide our adjustments to you uh, more quickly. So I just wanted to take a moment to see if there were any questions uh, from the group and to thank the group for helping to enhance the form. Okay, it sounds like no further questions as to that. Um, the next item is an update on the CS bars application process. Uh, so it is the time of year when application ca applications can be accepted for those who are interested in serving on CS bars. Of course, all of you as members are currently serving on CS bars, uh, but this is for the benefit of those you might refer or those in the public who are watching. The application period is open and has been open as normal, but we will be extending the application period through July 1st for a couple of reasons. Um, the first one is, as to this committee, members are appointed by the chair and the vice chair of the committee of bar examiners, and they generally will take their offices later in the summer. Um, therefore, that time can be provided back to the deans of the accredited and the registered law schools to determine and we've heard comments on two fronts. Some individuals have said, I'd like to participate, but with the additional uh, demands of the pandemic, I'm not certain yet if I can. Um, and others have said, I'd like a little bit more time to decide as well. Uh, because we can give that time, we've adjusted that. So you'll notice that the application deadline is July 1st, much later than the other commissions. In order to apply, uh, visit the CS Bars page on the website. You'll see the application link there. It's a very easy fillable application and we welcome applications from both um, deans of registered schools and deans of accredited schools. We will also potentially be, uh, be accepting applications from public members. The CBE does have two appointments to the committee and uh, Mr. Murphy will be concluding his three-year term at the end of this year as well. The committee will have the option to add an additional CBE member or to add a public member who has expertise in education and accreditation. Are there any questions about uh, the process or how to actually apply? Okay, I don't see any. All right, thank you. Okay, at this point, I think we are ready to turn to the two reports on the February and July 2022 bar exam. Natalie, uh, nice to see everyone today. Um, just to recap on February, the February 2022 California bar exam, as you know, was administered on February 22nd and 23rd. We did have, as always, a small number of accommodated applicants testing over extended days. This was our first return to an in-person exam administration in exactly two years. I want to thank you all for helping get all the communication out uh, to applicants and thank all the applicants, of course, for uh, their attentiveness and patience as we had uh, many layers of additional proof of entry into the exam for vaccinations, COVID testing, masking, all of that was um, new for that exam administration and the check-in process at all the test centers was very smooth, all things considered. Um, thank you to the Office of Admission staff, of course, for getting all that off the ground. And we had a lot of volunteers from State Bar staff overall who helped come and check people in at the door. So it was a real team effort and you all in this meeting that helped amplify those messages about what to pay attention to when for the bar exam are definitely a part of that team and I really appreciate it. Just to recap on the numbers, we ended up having 3,450 applicants attend the exam, 12 partials and 408 no-shows for the February exam. 
Um, moving on to the July 2022 bar exam, last week we posted FAQs about the July exam on the website. Since it's before we begin sending a cadence of reminder emails that I will forward to you, I wanted to highlight that in case you have not seen them. Please take a look. Please remind applicants to read through the FAQs and also send me any questions or concerns you have about what is posted. Until April 29th, applicants can apply for the upcoming bar exam with a $50 late fee. On April 30th, that fee goes up to $250. So just wanted to bring your awareness to that um, as today is April 20th. So that change in late fee is coming up in 10 days. Uh, as of today, this morning, we have 6,003 submitted applicants for the July exam. Another thing, if you haven't noticed it on our website, we did add a test center in Southern California, the Anaheim Convention Center. So we have plenty of seats um, in Southern California for the bar exam. The results of the February bar exam will be released after 6 p.m. on Friday, May 6th. That will also be the time when the July bar exam application will open for immediate repeaters. One more note uh, related to the February exam. Uh, so we've had great progress in providing those electronic oath packets and allowing for virtual swearing in ceremonies. We can now facilitate swearing in ceremonies for law schools and for applicants wherever they might be. Before COVID even, the number of attendees we had at our admissions led swearing in ceremonies was dwindling. And now um, due to the e oath packets and every all the virtual uh, docu signing that the applicants are doing as they are getting sworn in to be attorneys, um, the need for having those admissions led ceremonies uh, has definitely declined. So we're no longer going to be administering swearing in ceremonies on our end. That's just my last related update, and I will take any questions. Hi, George. Hi. Well, this relates to the first year. Could you, can I ask a question about that? Oh, sure. I, um, yeah. Um, I just, you know, I know it's going to be virtual, but I had a, a couple of students who have connectivity issues is is there any thought of the state bar to allow first year applicants to take the exam say it in the la office yes and that's in the application so oh it is okay. yeah and there are already several uh applicants who have been approved to come to the office to take the exam so if that's something that you know that someone might have missed that part of the application there's well, a, they, there's a they, section they, they failed that part of the exam already um no i didn't know that no thank you for yeah. It says right in the application, if you have extenuating circumstances, please um, list those out and, and then we get back in contact with that person. And we've already approved several. So if they somehow missed it, tell them to send a general request and we can we can deal with that request later. Actually, if memory serves, I think there's a, uh, one or two that haven't, yet. they were late that, you know, they're, they're, they're working on a deadline to file uh, for the chief exam. So um, oh. thanks. I'll let them know. Okay, yeah, in the application, we always provide space for extenuating circumstances and, of course, for accommodations. Okay, th uh, thank you. I think we're ready to, re to turn to recent developments, and there are several. Uh, the first one is a reminder uh, to everyone that for applicants that are taking the July 2022 bar exam, uh, the state bar is pleased again to offer the bar strategies and stories program. This is not provided directly by the state bar, but uh, rather created, uh, measured and administered by a consortium of academic researchers. Uh, it is a less than two hour program that helps the applicants to retain a productive mindset and early results for those who have taken the program have been extremely promising. Uh, the program is free to all applicants and they can register at the time that they sign up for the bar exam or through one of the customized emails sent to them. Um, they must sign up through the customized link because each link is unique to them. Uh, earlier this week, uh, the last reminder for wave one of the program went out, but there will be a second wave. There is time to sign up. So we greatly encourage you to amplify this message to all of your applicants that will be taking the exam from your school so they can take advantage of the Bar Strategies and Stories program. 
Um, a second note relates actually not to this meeting, but to the Committee of Bar Examiners meeting coming up on Friday. Um, while under Bagley Keen, we are not required to post memos in advance. We generally strive to post them five to 10 days in advance. Uh, at this time, we have our uh, March and April meetings very close together. Uh, there are very many Ed Standards items. Um, and so this has been challenging this month and four items are up. Uh, three more will be going up momentarily. They may be up by now at the time of this meeting. And there's an additional item that is in process and we've contacted that school. Uh, we hope to return to the typical schedule going forward, um, but just wanted to let everyone know about that who may be participating um, in Friday's meeting. And then for our final recent update, I'd like to turn it back to Audrey. Back to me. I just wanted to highlight, in case you didn't see it in your inbox, we sent through a law school regulation a message on Monday about needing volunteers to help us review first year law student exam content, so the content map and also actual item review. Um, so if you received that message and haven't gone back to digest it, please uh, have a read through it. Uh, applications for volunteers close on May 2nd. We sort of have a um, aggressive timeline for the review. And in the note we sent out, it does say feel free to forward it to others you think might be interested. Um, so please have a read through that if you haven't already and hopefully we'll get some more volunteers. Thank you. Uh, Dean Park. Hey, Audrey. Uh, hey. Thank you so much for uh, covering on the bar exam and those emails are always helpful. I definitely forward them to the team so um, we can know and help students to be on track. Um, just going to the comment about uh, the reviewers. Um, I was I was out, so I, I did miss that email, but could I, um, is, is it okay if I trouble you a little more about just giving some some context to that? Or sure, of course. Just for yeah. and also, you know, who are you looking for to apply? Is it more faculty? Um, just different things like that. We're open to a more broad list. It's in the email in terms of who can uh, reach out and apply. Um, but for the, the purposes, we're looking to um, review multiple choice questions for the first year law students exam. So part of that review is like a content map. So anyone who works with first year students to help review that would be great. The actual item review, we have to look for those who don't have students taking the exam. So uh, depending, you might uh, volunteer for just the content map overview, which is still super helpful, but not for the item review. And then it is, yeah, it can be broader than um, just faculty who help review and that's in the email. Great, thank you. I think that ends our staff report for this time, unless there are any other additional items. No further items. Thank you. Uh, we move on to item E, uh, which I think will be a very enjoyable conversation. I, I look forward to hearing how each team went forward on this project and, and their different angles. Uh, again, context, we had our team, our committee break into three separate teams uh, to focus on the pillars that the CSPARS has discussed historically, student success, consumer protection, transparency, life insurance, professionalism, and each uh, look at as well as to diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, I believe all three teams turned in uh, their assignment on time, which is excellent. Thank you everyone for the effort on that part. Uh, if possible, Ms. Leonard, could we start off with uh, Dean Keller and Mr. Murphy's submittal? Right. And I think you had a slideshow presented. Absolutely. Uh, just give me a moment to bring up the slideshow. And well, um, while Natalie's bringing up the slideshow, I'll just I want to note that uh, really uh, Dean Keller did the lion's share of the work on this. Uh, I would say 98, 99% of it. Uh, my contribution was just uh, uh, essentially affirming her ideas, uh, which I agree with and which are reflected in the memo. <clears throat> I think credit should go where it's it's deserved and uh, Dean Keller deserves all the credit. 
Right. Thank you. Um, it's definitely team effort in that we had an opportunity to uh, talk before we actually started working on anything, which was very helpful um, and being able to consult with Natalie and, and Robert just to get a little more background. Um, and Robert actually paired these uh, slide shells for us. The first slides, um, I don't know if Natalie, you want to go through those from the staff perspective um, before we get to uh, yeah. things that I did. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. So first of all, just to bring everyone uh, back to the same page, this is an item that was discussed first at the Committee of Bar Examiners back in January, uh, discussing a longstanding waiver of unaccredited guideline 1.1, which places limitations on the state bar exam review courses that can be part of the registered schools uh, JD programs. So the committee referred that guideline to CS bars for study, and it provided the following red line to start. Uh, the goal of the study was to see if the waiver could be made permanent, and if so, uh, what conditions, if any, should be placed on the new permanent possibility to include uh, state bar exam prep classes for credit. Uh, this was placed in the January CBE item, and um, it was also daylighted at the last March um, CS bars meeting, at which point three teams were created to study. Um, and I'll have available for reference numbers that I know that this group would be very familiar with, just what have been the most recent pass rates for the first year law students examination, as well as the bar exam. Uh, this is a lot of numbers. I wouldn't expect anyone to digest them, but just a reminder that they are um, on the state bars website and I have them here if they can enrich the discussion. Um, so the first two were the, for the bar exam. I'm sorry, the first year law students exam, the second two are for the bar exam, showing the various um, overall pass rates for first time repeaters and all takers. The groups were divided into uh, three of these four areas, though these were borrowed from the purposes for accreditation that were uh, created for the accredited law school rules. These purposes also apply to the work of the registered schools as well. So one group studied the effect of consumer protection and transparency on a guideline modification. Another group, Linda Keller's group and Greg Murphy's group, which you'll hear from first, talked about the effect on student success. Um, and then at the final group, we'll talk about preparation for licensure and the role this can play. Um, consistent with the state bar strategy to make sure that diversity, equity, and inclusion is built in, not bolted on. Um, all three groups were added, were asked to keep that element in mind when they were creating their recommendations. So at this point, I'll turn it back to Dean Keller and Greg Murphy. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so as was said, we looked at this issue through the lens of student success. And our baseline starting point was that, of course, passing the first year law students exam is necessary to student success for all students at unaccredited registered schools. And that passing the bar is also a key part of student success. And we recognize that there is some discussion about students who might go to law school without planning to practice, um, but the consensus was that you know most students do plan to practice. There's too much uncertainty uh, about those who may or may not um, decide to, to take the bar um, either just in case or just because at the last minute. So we thought there was too much uncertainty to develop a two-tiered definition of student success about licensure and, and success, particularly given responsibility of law schools. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Right. So after exploring the various considerations, we propose that schools should be allowed to offer such uh, courses for credit without any uh, caps on units. We felt that concerns about either self-dealing or inappropriate outsourcing of courses um, can be addressed through the current rules and guidelines, um, which we've specifically cross-referenced in our proposed language. So you see there um, at the end, those are just highlighting some of the rules that we thought would 
uh, respond to some of the concerns that came up um, in the last meeting. Okay. Um, moving to the next slide, um, as we discussed how to define a test or bar preparation or review course, we ran into some difficulties with defining and implementing it accurately and fairly to try to set up a clear distinction between test and bar review or preparation courses versus other classes. Uh, as you all know, the current bar exam is, is under review in terms of the future, but it's presumed at this point that it's measuring the knowledge and skills needed for practice, which means that any law school course that prepares students for practice could also be said to be a bar prep course. And all first year courses that cover the topics tested on that first year law students exam could also be said to be test prep courses. So after discussion, we thought that parsing out the differences between preparation courses and other courses would not be feasible. There are too many different types of uh, classes that might incorporate skills. Um, prep courses might add new subject matter, electives work on skills that are critical to um, particularly the performance test aspect of the bar, et cetera. Uh, moving to the next slide, we were asked to address these three different types of potential bar prep courses. So one approach integrating just the bar prep into the curriculum meaning into so-called doctrinal courses. And we certainly think that's advisable, but not sufficient. You know, the better approach is to offer exam preparation courses that can implement self-regulated learning, space repetition, and other pedagogical tools to enhance comprehension, retention, and understanding of how the different law school courses or subjects intersect on the bar and in practice. With regard to whether it should be a separate in-house or commercially taught course, we felt that schools should be able to choose based on their own um, expertise and resources. Um, if there are concerns about um, having you know, a student go off on their own and take a commercial course and then come back and say, oh, hey, I'd like credit for this, um, we think that can be you know, addressed by having the, the law school oversee the course to ensure that it meets um, the requirements that any other course would need to meet um, to earn units. Right. Next slide, please. Um, and just like other courses, um, we suggest that a bar review or test review or preparation classes should be eligible for credit, provided they meet the rules and guidelines. Uh, we think there are several benefits to offering four credit courses. And this is something we see acknowledged, for instance, by the ABA, whose students can take bar prep courses without limitation. We tried to outline some of those benefits on the slide, which cross over with diversity, equity, and inclusion concerns. This leads us to the, the next slide and the next question we were asked to consider. Should there be a limit on the number of units allowed for bar preparation classes? As noted above, we thought there were difficulties with defining or even counting units um, for what would be considered a bar review or preparation course, which makes a cap um, particularly uh, inapplicable here. Also, the rules and guidelines already require that there be a balanced course of study which we suggest should be assessed in the context of the school's overall curriculum and mission. For the next slide regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion, we think these goals will be furthered by allowing students to earn units for test preparation courses at unaccredited schools, um, the same, for example, as uh, ABA students can do. 
the unaccredited and Cal schools in California serve a much more diverse student population. Um, we were able to uh, get the slides from the Office of Access and Inclusion for this meeting, but I don't think that aspect is um, really in dispute. Uh, students at unaccredited schools are less likely to have the time and resources compared to many ABA graduates, most of whom can devote months of study time exclusively to bar preparation after graduation allowing students at registered law schools to get a jump on bar prep during law school, just like ABA students would further diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. That obviously is just a brief survey. Um, Natalie, I know, uh, has the longer memo um, spelling out um, these points, uh, but we're certainly happy to take questions as well. Nice. Do we have a hand raised, but I'm not sure who's raising their hand. It's either Dan, Dean Clancy or Paul Kramer. Yeah, it's Paul. Um, my concern about an unlimited allocation or the potential to have an unlimited amount of bar prep courses is that it um, reduces the breadth of the legal education um, that a student would receive. Uh, theoretically, without a limit, somebody could only study the core subjects that are tested on the bar exam for four years. And um, that just, that's not creating a, um, uh, a well-informed bar, you know, law school graduate, in my opinion. And, you know, I, of course, I hearken back to the 80s, early 80s when I was in law school. And, you know, we had many electives. And, um, and uh, well, well, I think um, some amount of prep is perfectly appropriate and allowable. Um, I, my main concern is not about um, being able to define it, um, although that's an interesting twist, the idea that uh, just defining it is going to be difficult. Um, I, I do not want to see um, our law school system become just a trade school or a, a bar, you know, basically a bar review course um, that only qualifies somebody to, to pass the bar, um, but not, um, you know, to, to practice over the breadth of subjects that they might um, encounter. Uh, you know, and, and then one of the concerns I think coming out of the, the study of the content of the bar exam is um, there seems to be a move to narrow the amount of subjects that can be tested and therefore the, the scope of subjects that students have to study and refresh themselves about in order to prepare for the bar exam. So uh, that could be those, these two trends could be um, really um, have the potential to realize my worst fears for the legal education system, that it's simply a, a way to to give people uh, the ability to hang out a shingle, um, but leaving them less prepared than uh, the traditional legal education that, that most of us are used to um, would, would lead to. Yeah, so I mean, if I may respond, we certainly um, you know, thought about and talked about that. So, and as you mentioned, yeah, part of the issue is just if you will say, you can only have X number of units, then we have to figure out how do we count the units and that became problematic. Um, I do think certainly if the bar changes, then that you know, is, will have uh, impacts on how all of this might fit together. Although if the bar changes, as I'm hearing what they're talking about, the bar changes would be decreasing the number of topics potentially, but vastly increasing the skills that have to be taught. Um, so that's not really going to mean there's you know, a lot more time for, for fun electives. Um, and I think to me also there's sort of the basic starting point is you know it's great to have you know students who have had chance to take uh, electives in all different areas of law, but if they can't pass the bar, that's all pointless for them to have that knowledge in, in the niche areas. Um, and it seems that the 
the current rules and guidelines already require that a balanced um, st study of law or balanced curriculum. I don't remember the exact language offhand. Um, so if, if it was truly nothing but bar prep and could be said to be nothing but bar prep and not address any, any of the other um, areas or skills needed to practice law, then I think that would already be um, addressed under the particular uh, rules and guidelines in existence. Um, I think an interesting point about um, that is, you know, we want students to be able to take these electives so that when they get out and practice, they're exposed to different areas. Um, and certainly, you know, that's, that's great. Although I think most of us encounter our students who end up in areas they never took classes in. And, um, and it's those, the skills that they learned in preparing for the bar that allow them to dive into an entirely new area of law and be able to, um, you know, come up to speed and, and be able to um, you know, professionally and ethically represent um, their clients even if they have never taken that class in, in law school. Um, okay. so, so then um, getting into something like environmental law, um, that still teaches one to think like a lawyer. Um, it teaches one to analyze um, statutes and cases, um, all useful skills. Uh, so I, um, I don't see that as, um, you know, something that, uh, to be avoided in favor of just getting them past the bar. Um, as far as the definition goes, could we not write something that says, in effect, when you are revisiting torts um, in a class, uh, after you've had the, uh, you know, the, the foundational class, that that is starting to sound like bar review. And that's that's I mean those are really interesting comments because as we were describing the you know the benefits of the environmental law class the way you were describing it as oh it's skills that you need for the bar to pass the bars and I heard oh so then we would have to count that environmental law class in whole or in part as a bar prep class towards a units cap and that's the the difficulty that I see. Um, and in terms of, you know, yeah, if we, if we put it as a definition of revisiting a topic that you already had, for instance, torts, um, you know, there are so many different ways that that might come up. I mean, that might be in a clinic, it might be in an externship, it might be in, um, you know, a, a different elective course that very beneficially allows you to review and expand on your knowledge of torts or some other subject that you learned earlier on. And so that's where we started, you know, having you know, real difficulties in trying to parse out those different pieces. And I suspect some of my, my colleagues with their hands raised have, have um, other thoughts that I certainly don't want to uh, overlook. I can make one more. Um, so um, wouldn't you, as the operator of a school prefer some kind of safe harbor because the, the definitional argument is suggesting that we really can't, um, we can't draw a line and we just have to review each school's program as it is. Um, but that, that's gonna lead to a bunch of um, uh, deep analysis of your programs from the bar staff and the committee um, which I presume you'd rather avoid. So um, I, I, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm guessing that there's some value to the schools to have a safe harbor. Um, but, but when we say we can't define it, we are really preventing that. But, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that is, that is true. I guess I'm not sure what the difference is between saying we're going to have like, as you put it, a safe harbor or some other definition of how many units, if the if staff and committee are scrutinizing that, then they're still going to be getting into trying to uh, parse out the different pedagogical advantages to different approaches and in ways that you know, may not uh, make sense to do particularly in a, in a vacuum as opposed to with a, you know, a site team with uh, expertise who's looking at the curriculum as a whole and in terms of the, 
the overall mission of the school. And uh, as an example, uh, community member Kramer, uh, each of our groups was charged with looking at this independently. So it'll be interesting to see how each group came to their conclusion as they went through. And, and I think depending on how we define what a bar review is, will help us if we want to have a limitation. Because if we have a difficulty defining it, we definitely do not want a limitation. Uh, as an example, I've taught remedies. Remedies as a course is a review of contracts, torts, and property, but it's not a bar review. It's almost the algebra of law school as it relates to the addition, subtraction of contracts towards in property. You need to know those doctrinal concepts and you have to review them again in remedies, but you're learning it at a higher level. So I think it's hard to separate those out. It'll be interesting as we go to each of our teams, I think depending on how they defined bar review will indicate whether they have a limitation or no limitation. The more precise the definition, the easier it is to limit. If it's a gray definition, I don't know how we can have a limitation. Uh, Dean Lill, I think you had your hand up next. Yes, thanks. Uh, I think I was going to wait to our turn, but let me add a couple of thoughts. I mean, we're talking about one guideline within the panoply of the entire body of unaccredited and unaccredited guidelines. And, and from what I'm hearing in opposition to what this team has offered is the idea that uh, you ignore all the other guidelines. You know, schools work exceedingly hard. And every dean that I know, myself included, are there to do what is required by the committee, which is to provide our students with a quality legal education. And nothing you've described where, you know, students would only be taking bar prep courses for, for four plus years would come close to being compliant with a whole host of current guidelines that talk about, you know, the form and content um, of, of, of courses being offered. Uh, another point not to be lost is, you know, I run and my faculty run our law school and our curriculum. The students don't. And so the thought that some student would be able to evade you know, the, the committee's guidelines, our scholastic requirements uh, to sit and spend three or four years studying bar review is, is frankly you know, impossible and, and shouldn't really be part of this conversation. Um, I, I think every dean that I know, every school that I'm familiar with, particularly my, my own, you know, this is our primary goal. Uh, is our student success, both substantively in, in terms of, a, you know, of a, uh, as robust a JD curriculum that, that we can afford with the resources that we have, um, and um, a faculty that are thoroughly dedicated to you know, teaching the substantive law. We, we have, we're limited, we, we offer exact electives, and I look every, every year with new electives, we're offering, um, you know, a bankruptcy elective this year because I have several students who hope to practice in that area of law. Uh, I'm working with one of my professors who's uh, been a workers' comp practitioner for 25 years. We're going to be offering workers' comp next semester. So, and I, I speak because I know what my school's doing. I think all schools are doing this as well to give our students the uh, ability uh, to know what they'd want to practice and, and develop some level of interest and expertise. But before they can do that in my program, they've got to pass the first year exam. And for everybody's students, they have to pass the bar exam. So um, it, not, nobody here, I think, would, would uh, come close to falling into the trap that you've described, where you know, students are just taking bar review and, and little or nothing else. It's just, just not part of who we are and what we do. Thank you. Uh, Dean Park, I think you had your hand up next. Thank you so much. and. Um... I, I do want to give some brief comment, but I noticed Greg Murphy has his hand up and he's a presenter in the subcommittee. So I want to definitely defer to him speaking on his own uh, subcommittee work first. Um, just so. Mr. Murphy. Well, uh, Linda did a, a fine job of summarizing it. We, we had a, a significant long, extremely long discussion about all this. And of course, I've, I've had these discussions before in other contexts, including the task force on the bar exam before and, and you know, in the council when I chaired the accreditation committee at the ABA. Uh, for me, it comes down to, you know, uh, the most important thing from our perspective that you know, I, Keller and I looked at was student success. And almost all of them would define it as passing the bar examination. And then the question is, okay, do bar review courses help people pass a bar examination? And I think there are plenty of studies that's actually shown that those who actually do the work and complete the work have a much better chance of passing the bar examination. So from a student perspective, I don't think there's a reason to limit it. Now, 
the number of courses is an interesting topic. And we, the canon of the first year, torts and contracts and property, you know, I don't need to talk about that, all, all of the, the, the seven or eight topics now on the, on the MBE, but, you know, those are the courses that teach people whereby, whereby which students actually learn not only substantive law, but how to think like a lawyer, elements of, a, of an offense or a claim, a def defense and all that. That all comes in that context. Um, and frankly, the task force, uh, uh, Natalie, you can correct me if, if I, I say this wrong, but it came around to the conclusion that really the bar exam should be testing those, testing just what's necessary to uh, demonstrate minimum competency. Now, of course, we, law schools, uh, uh, as Dean Kramer said, there are more about, there are, there are about more than that. And I certainly agree, but um, I don't think that we're going to see a parade of horribles with people just bar view law schools. Um, you know, when the ABA lifted its and allowed the grant, get grant to uh, credit for bar review courses, you know, we didn't see, you know, a, a, a d disruption of the overall curriculum. And I think we can place some faith in the faculty administrators to deliver a quality education that will help those students um, learn how to think like lawyers, learn doctrine, and uh, have a reasonable shot at passing the bar examination. So uh, I, 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 I as you balance it, and I certainly understand the arguments because I believe that an education in an approved law school is the best preparation to becoming a lawyer and too much emphasis in, in some places put on the bar exam. But um, uh, that let, let's not lose sight of what this, the, the students' goals are and that's to get through the bar. And anything that can help in that regard, I think is well merited. Thank you. Dean Park again. Uh, thank you so much. Um, just a quick comment on the work. Um, thank you so much for that presentation and just uh, just conveying very in very clear way um, what the recommendation is. Um, I think our chair is right that uh, we're going to see the work of the three subcommittees and they'll offer three different perspectives. But um, I I I am very supportive of what I've seen from the first subcommittee. Um, actually a struggle that uh, our subcommittee faced was just uh, what to study and what amount of time. And even then, does that mean, do you know um, uh, uh, what to put or create as a guideline just about our review? And uh, I really like, I wish I thought of um, just that idea that you are cross-referencing to those rules and guidelines that exist and that should be watched for implementing what is still part of your program, even though we're trying to delineate it as a subset. Um, my other comment too was um, when I look, because I know not everyone might may be familiar with the, the law school rules for registered uh, law schools and, and guidelines, at least to the point of working with them like a registered law school dean. But, um, you know, guidelines 5.10 content of curriculum, which refers to unaccredited law school rule 4.240E, which itself is um, referring to a number of operational and educational standards. Um, these aren't empty regulations, uh, there is a lot of content there. 5.11 balance and competence course of study and then 5.12 practical skills. So I just, you know, um, wanna remind, uh, and I think that's what the first subcommittee did well in terms of referencing what's existing, um, that there is all that there. Uh, the last thing I had to say was just in terms of pedagogy, I think um, I think we all know law students need more than bar review. They need bar review and need more than bar review to be successful as a lawyer, as a thinker. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think bar review can take that approach, right, with black letter law, kind of a frozen form of the law to be testing with. But um, I'm just in agreement with the, the first co committee that how to slice and dice that so that it's serving all students, um, you know, of all demographics, of all the diversity of learning styles they may have. Um, you know, until that's something that is more settled, 
um, I do think law schools do need room to, to be able to design, to study and design. And um, in my opinion, if we are able to present about that uh, in the context of how we design curriculum, that might be a good thing um, rather than saying they have to be dealt with differently than that. So that, that's it. Thank you. Uh, now we still have three hands up. I don't know if there's just resting virtually or if there's any questions from community member Kramer or comments or from Mr. Murphy. Well, just definitely want to echo uh, what Dean Park was saying uh, to Dean Keller, Mr. Murphy, excellent job. You know, I don't think we could have imagined it being better than that. <laughs> and it definitely is a, a great job for our conversation. You can see even without the other teams presenting anything, we had a great conversation already. So I think that is perfect. And that was our goal. That, that's what we we're trying to achieve here by doing that. Our, our next group was with Dean Park and Dean Clancy uh, through the additional lens of consumer protection. So I, I don't know if we have an additional slide or their red line draft or how they'd like to present that conversation. We have their cover slide and when you're ready, uh, we could show your red line draft unless you'd prefer to show the three together after all three groups have gone. Um, I need to have our red line draft and we also had a memo and a chart of study on law schools. So I, I don't, um, and I wasn't prepared to upload the files on those since I thought those would have been sent in. Is there a way those can be pulled up? Or? Absolutely, I have those available to display. Uh, would you like the memo or would you like the, um, the text of the guideline? Uh, and for this, I'd like to check with my partner. Certainly. So um, Dean Clancy, would you like to start with the memo? And I have also the no, tape. I was, I, I was thinking that we would start with our revised version of 1.11 so that we can compare it to the proposed revision of the last group and then maybe start the discussion that way. That sounds great to me. Certainly, let me share that to the screen. Here we go, and you can let me know when to slide down. It doesn't quite fit. All right, how about if I explain that similar to the decision made by the last group, uh, we decided that uh, law schools should be allowed to offer uh, review courses for course credit and to make that a condition of uh, the JD degree. Uh, we also, like the last group, decided that uh, the law schools, this being the unaccredited schools for this guideline, should be able to offer credit for commercial courses taken. And we, unlike the last group, put in a 12 unit maximum limitation on credit for review courses. I can explain to all of you or, or, or admit to all of you that there was a lot of discussion between us regarding whether or not there should be a maximum limitation. And we talked at one point of there being no limit. Uh, we talked at another point of making a limitation at, at nine. I think in the end, we decided that, that if there has to be a limitation that the 12 seemed reasonable. Uh, three units in the first year for review related to the first year bar examination, as well as the ultimate bar examination and then three units for each of the other years in a four-year program, all adding up to a total of 12. But I have to say, as I'm sitting here now, that I'd be happier with no limitation. So I certainly do understand the concerns of, of Mr. Kramer. Uh, certainly, we don't want law schools to be teaching only bar review. Uh, that would be uh, horrific. Yet I understand the comments of the others and, and agree that they wouldn't happen. So I'm happy with there being no limitation, uh, yet we did in our proposed revision state that there would be a maximum of 12. I think 12 uh, is reasonable. What we did in our group when we started to work on this project was we, we decided that we would create a chart 
and we would chart out what the three ABA schools are doing in the way of bar review, as well as three CBE accredited schools are doing in the way of bar review. And we found that uh, there was a range of anywhere from two credits to nine credits in those schools that offer bar review. But the reality is that there are many schools that don't offer a bar review at all. But for those that do, the range seemed to be two to nine. So uh, 12 fits with what we found is happening now. Uh, it's three units more than that. But again, it, it seems reasonable, especially when you consider the fact that in California accredited and unaccredited schools, uh, the students have to deal with the baby bar. So we're thinking three credits for each academic year. So we, we broke our, our work into three parts. The, the chart was uh, one part of it. We also looked at historical background so that we could get some context as we worked on the project. And then the third part was preparing the the proposed revision to, to 111. In the way of historical background, uh, we found that the ABA back in 2008 decided to allow law schools to teach bar review courses for credit. And we found that they did so because of concern about diversity in the legal profession, as well as uh, concern about the rising cost of law school education and the rising cost of commercial courses. But I think from what I read, that the, the main concern was about diversity. And we read that in 2009, not long after the ABA made its change, the CBE changed its rules for the accredited law schools, uh, but did not do the same thing for the unaccredited law schools. And the, the, the rules are different, as we know. There was a temporary waiver put in place at one point to make the rules somewhat similar between the accredited schools and the unaccredited schools, but uh, they're, they're, not, they're not the same. How about at this point, if we switch to Jessica to talk about the chart? And um, wait, please to keep the red line up a little bit longer. Sorry. Oh, sure. I'll, 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 I'll put it back up. To cover, cover a piece of it. Thank you so much. So um, as, as or uh, as I can remind um, everyone, uh, if you do not already know, we were in the consumer protection and transparency group. And so um, as part of that focus, um, beyond checking, studying um, a subset of schools, which is, which is the chart um, that um, is in large part where we're deriving this language or um, informing the thinking behind our language, um, that's why we have this paragraph about what law schools must disclose. Uh, we thought as the focus group with the consumer protection and transparency um, topic that um, this would be possibly an important um, way for the, the consumers that we would be worried about the students to, to have a disclosure. Um, uh, that being said, I just want to echo uh, what Dean Clancy said. Uh, when we were thinking through this, we really did it based on a small subset that we were able to study in that time. Um, I don't want that to mean that's ever a good reason to you know, propose a whole new guideline on all of a demographic, but that's just what was feasible within the time. So. Um, I still uh, echo what I said about the first subcommittee's uh, good work that I, I like how they actually are in reinforcing what's there versus something that might be a little more unilateral. With that, um, yes, I would be happy to cover the chart. Um, this was something Dean Clancy and I worked on. It is by no means meant to be comprehensive, but again, as part of our charge for thinking about DEI, thinking about consumer protection and transparency. Um, that's why we developed this chart. So as Dean Clancy and I were thinking through our task, um, we took, and this is getting a bit ground level, but we, we took our slide for the consumer protection group and the questions that were there. And we thought, 
well, what if we asked um, about those questions to a selection of law schools? And um, we, uh, I went through a lot of the selection, so I could take credit or blame there, but um, we actually went through and looked at what are nationally recognized uh, part-time law schools in California that are ABA approved. Um, because those are recognized as being for the working adult demographic in a lot of ways. And I thought that that's a bit more fair to um, compare to the unaccredited law school group. And we also selected um, three CALs as well. Um, we took what was publicly disclosed at their accreditation groups um, about bar passage, just as a consideration. So, and then we also looked at admissions um, how bar prep seem to be defined, if at all, um, in catalog. Um, so uh, with that, uh, this is actually the CD accredited law school sample, although there is also a CA uh, California ABA example here and um, just the criteria that's set. And there is actually four schools to this table, but uh, just in terms of how it fit, three are here. So there was a look at Lincoln Law School, Glendale University School of Law, Santa Barbara College of Law. Just look, look at their admissions, their, what we could pull from public disclosures um, by their accreditation uh, group or with the state bar site in this case. And then um, what Dean Clancy and I did is we went through catalogs and websites, um, mostly website, but catalog if directed there from the website about how they're defining um, or going through bar exam review. So that's an example here in that column or, or row. Um, and a lot of it is about support to law school students. Um, some of it, I will just say is mixed, meaning um, uh, there, and this will show up, I think in another example that there can be uh, discussion about um, bar examination preparation linked to a legal capstone um, or linked to a very specific still set in a class. So it varied, but we took a look through that and tried to think through that as we were coming up with our recommendation. And um, Natalie, if you could scroll down uh, through this table, uh, this will give you an idea of, you know, what further was said here on bar prep, um, we took a look at, you know, how it was graded, how many units there were, and where we drew the reference. And if we can scroll down further, because this is a pretty long table, um, we look through and we put down our judgment whether it seemed mandatory or not as far as there was language. Was there one or more courses? How many units overall? Um, and please scroll down further. And um, to be clear, these were actually what were the questions in the consumer protection and transparency slide that Dean Clancy and I were working off of. Then for D, oh, oh, also does the law school engage outside providers? Is it reference? And does the law school have financial interest or you know things that would make us think about that? So, uh, the do variations of the bar review exist for specific demographics? If so, what? That came out of the DEI um, assignment. And um, for now, there's not many ways to look at that question in relation to bar review, even if you look at commercial bar review providers. But we added that question just as a thought of if we would find something as we were going through to add that. Um, these are the three CALs that we looked at. Um, there would be one more, scroll down further, and um, probably in a column to itself, University of Laverne. Um, but um, this offers more of a look at, again, what a law school can be doing to support its students. And as the first committee mentioned, if good support um, through curriculum means that they are attaining their goal, um, that's part of why we tracked MPR with any of the schools we selected under our criteria. 
So um, bar prep defined here, we notice that there's some required, some voluntary, um, and here is actually our comprehensive legal education capstone, which was, uh, I thought, a very interesting form of um, definitely, you know, bar review is not the primary reason for this course, but they make sure to disclose to their students um, that it does provide early review and preparation for the bar exam, which I think is part of um, giving something that obviously students are very interested in in their duty program. So um, if we can scroll down further, we just go through a similar set and um, again, under sort of the time limitations and just reviewing it, we did not speak to any um, administrators of these schools uh, about this. This was more about what we could find in catalog um, or the website, again, thinking about our consumer protection and transparency directive. So, um, so I hope no one feels uh, frustrated that we didn't maybe ask more about these in a call or anything as we could have done. But this was just, you know, limited time and uh, mostly for our curiosity as well, what could we find through this process. So, and we found, by the way, just a lot to respect in what these law schools are doing. And obviously there's so much more in curriculum that they're doing, but um, this table can only uh, contain so much. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to make sure to go to our uh, California ADA law school table. And it's just a very similar process, same questions being shown for those. So here, um, there were three law schools selected. Um, what was very critical to these was, did it seem like um, they were serving working adults? Um, or students that wouldn't be going to program full time, you know, are they in California? Do they have higher recent ultimate bar passage rate as reported at the AD Law School's disclosure site? And the last thing I'd like to add here is that that admissions permitting other than LSAT was another um, point of interest for us, just because a lot of these um, unaccredited law schools, uh, including ALU, um, uh, do not require the LSAT. So uh, here, this was just a look at their ultimate bar passage rates, what they offered, similar to what we did to the CALs um, that they talk about on their website or in catalog. Um, so here, fundamentals of bar exam writing, uh, courses like basic bar studies and solving legal problems, and advanced analysis. Now, that doesn't say bar exam in it, but um, you can see that reference to test taking there. Does that mean the bar exam? Maybe not. But again, um, this was just kind of a way to sweep through. And uh, uh, please go ahead and scroll down further. I'm sorry that um, for a lot of text here. But again, I think you could uh, at least see the diversity of how these schools are serving their students. But uh, the same questions are being asked of this group with the, uh, with the counts above. Um, what did Dean Clancy and I derive out of this study, which was done to inform ourselves a little bit better about what was being discussed at our last CS bars? Um, I think it can come down to that one bullet point that was in Dean Keller's slides or uh, Dean Keller's and Greg Murphy's slides. There's a great deal of diversity here. Um, there are different ways uh, what we're discussing is being defined. But um, when we look through this and we look through, we thought, well, all of these law schools are for working adult students. Um, they're more flexible on their admissions and that they might not require the LSAT. There's ways there delivering good curriculum and good program. So that is part of what informed us towards um, considering that number of 12. Um, it started out as nine, but then um, all of these do not serve students that have to take the first year of Austin's examination. So um, 
but even then, you know, um, I have not spoken to any registered law school dean about a number like like this um, and this project. And um, we really, Dean Clancy and I have just thought through this based on what we could try and do in the time allotted. Um, so uh, we, we're trying to recommend that red line serving really that focus and um, you know, offering perspective, you know, what could go towards commerce, consumer protection and transparency in terms of you know, what maybe law schools should talk about or disclose and um, sort of our best faith thoughts on um, how this guideline could go. Um, sorry that the table was so hard to see, but um, I hope that this is just um, helpful so you understand our subcommittee was, was trying to gather uh, thoughts and um, make it database to help uh, support the work of the group. And with that, um, I don't have further about the chart, but Dean Clancy did want to check with you if you did want the our memo um, to come up to screen. We can put that up. I don't know how much time is left. I want to make sure that, that others can participate here too. If there's time for it, sure, let's put it up. We can make time. You know, I think that it's an important discussion that we're having. And again, each of us came at a different angle from our team. So if you think it's helpful, let's definitely show it. And, and for this, I would... Um, as Dean Clancy said, uh, basically here, uh, quite different from the chart. Um, this was more of a bigger picture look at um, the context of, of uh, what we were looking at as a topic and especially referring to the history of what we've known to exist about this topic. Um, actually, because of the la lack of benchmarks elsewhere, that, uh, you know, especially as to coming to a number or coming up with, you know, different ideas of disclosures. Um, there was a lot um, to cover here that would be outside our chart. Um, and I'm happy to let Dean Clancy speak to that. But um, there, is a, there is a bigger historical perspective we looked at and thought through, um, but it was actually due to the lack of benchmarks we thought okay, let's see what can we offer further in terms of a, a data look uh, on those seven law schools. So uh, with that, Dean Clancy, is there anything you would want to say more about um, the memo? No, I think we've taken up a lot of time here. I don't want to take much more, but there's one part of that memo that's important and I, that's most important, and that is the, the cost of commercial review courses. Uh, there's a part in the memo where it talks about a range between $2,000 and upwards of 6,000 and some odd dollars for review courses. And that's what students have to pay if they uh, wish to take a course to pass the bar exam. It seems to me that there must be many students who, who don't take commercial bar review courses. I know that it's true for our students. I'm guessing it's true for our students at other schools. For that reason, the law school should provide something. Uh, and I think that, that it should be more than just one course. I like the idea of 12 units as a maximum, either that or, or no limitation, so that schools can focus on what their students need to get through the bar examination. As far as consumer protection goes, the reality is that our students are consumers and our schools are product providers. It's true about the ABA schools, it's true about the California accredited schools, it's true about the California unaccredited schools. As product providers, we need to help our people pass the test. And we need to do more than, than just teach the subjects for the, uh, for the substantive courses. We need to give them something in the way of review, especially because the students in our schools are the ones most likely to not be able to afford taking a commercial course. 
That's all I have to say at the moment. Thank you, uh, Dean Park, Dean Clancy. Uh, another excellent, you know, very data-driven analysis, right? which is from a different angle, which is, I think is very helpful to us. Uh, Dean Lilly, you had your hand up. Uh, yes. Uh, first, thanks, uh, Jessica and Mike. That was very impressive, uh, given the amount of time I know it must have taken. Uh, it, it did highlight uh, an interesting point uh, uh, that I think is relevant to the discussion, because I think it was USD's, uh, an ABA school, and their description of, of what bar prep is, and they get into um, uh, really is academic support. And if you look at, as I have, uh, a number of ABA schools as to what they're offering, um, you know, it isn't as well defined as perhaps what we're discussing. Some do, uh, is labeled bar prep, and, and it, it's a timing issue uh, or first year prep. Um, and I'd just like to make the point and hopefully support the idea that having no limitation makes the most sense because um, if you were to limit schools in um, what is qualified or classified as academic support that might um, carry through the entire semester or perhaps even three or four year program. Um, and that's something I've been thinking about to give my students, you know, again, more support. Um, our first year prep course, um, they don't even take it until they're done for the entire first year. And, and while we provide some tutoring and, and the like, I, I'd like to be able to um, perhaps embed, um, you know, true academic support. So um, you, one task would be to more clearly define what's academic support when it's offered in the curriculum uh, and, and actual uh, first year or bar prep. Um, they can be together, but then, then you've got an issue of, you know, how many units um, apply to each. So it just, for furthering our discussion, if, if to keep in mind that not all bar prep is academic support and not all academic support is bar prep. I think that's a great point. And I, I just wanna add something here um, because we didn't wanna have a row that just you know, had a law school's academic support page, right? Um, uh, that, that definitely was a part of what, we definitely saw more law schools, but sometimes what they, they had was they had an academic support and bar exam page to their whole website to go through that didn't necessarily indicate um, something further. So I think you're right. Um, we wouldn't want to necessarily force it to go one way or another. Thank you. I see we have a handout at our Sacramento site, but I'm not sure who's raising it. It's Paul. Um, just an observation in, in your draft of the, the, uh, the guideline or rule, I forgot which it is now, um, you refer to disclosure of ownership interests in a commercial bar prep course. Um, what about expanding that to include um, other financial interests, for instance, if the faculty of the school is teaching and they're by, you know, receiving income through the bar prep course, I think that's just as much of a conflict and should be a part of that. Do you agree? We actually went through this um, in terms of forming that, that guideline and the struggle we had, which is why I like what the first subcommittee did in terms of the cross-purposing or cross-referencing is that um, you can have, especially in the academic support arena, you can have faculty that are licensing instructional tutorials um, online, especially these days, um, course content, um, practice, you know, and um, I think what was the struggle Dean Clancy and I ran into was, okay, if you mandate those disclosures to the bar review, um, is that creates a disparity? You know, why isn't the financial interests of the faculty in all of the curriculum, not just bar review, something that the consumer has to be protected from and know about? And so the more we went into that and, you know, just even faculty members and imagining their reaction, like they do not see themselves as, as um, commercial bar prep providers, you know, when they create an instructional about, you know, how to do IREC, it just, it can really create, or even, you know, how to write <clears throat> and analyze under time for a uh, exam essay. 
it just, it starts going into areas where um, at least I can say, I think Dean Clancy and I discussed this, so I think it's right to say we're both thinking through it, but I just was concerned that would become an area of, of um, not only pushback, but just a lot of complication. Um, if we are worried for the protection of the consumer, you know, about all these things, why aren't we worrying about them in the rest of curriculum? And I think the answer is we typically don't. Um, and, but we still have this, this uh, language suggested here because let's say for a bar review um, that, you know, the law school is partnering externally for, like, yes, maybe the student should know about that. Maybe it would affect whether they would even select into that if that course is an elective, right? Um, but we just couldn't see, we couldn't see the same thing when it came to, you know, um, do, you, do you need to know that the faculty might get anything because we happen to be using, you know, her online tutorial for writing timed essays and things like that. So I hope that helps to address the question. Well, it doesn't address my concern. Um, we're talking about somebody referring, and we're just talking about disclosure, not prohibition. Um, and somebody referring a student to a particular bar review course where they actually happen to be, uh, you've, you've decided if they own the course, that's something they have to disclose. Um, but I don't see a major difference between owning it and deriving income from it because they, you know, as a sideline, they teach from uh, for that course provider as well. But I, think, I think what we have is, right, law school owners, administrators, instructors, and staff must not compel or solicit to attend a commercial, and then they must disclose to students any ownership interest of the school, its owners, administrators, instructors, and staff, any co commercial review course, right? Um, yeah, okay. Um, I would add, um, you know, other financial interests, at least, at least, uh, you know, direct income from, um, but. Uh, yeah, I think my answer well. earlier, yeah, it's, well, just to be responsive, I think my earlier point about um, what I covered, that that's part of why we didn't do that. Yeah, you see it as a slippery slope towards other disclosures that you don't think are appropriate, but um, we, we quite often live on slippery slopes. Uh, Dean Keller, I see if you hand up. Yes, um, I don't know if it's possible to put the, the red line up to see that language again, um, but I'm trying to think about what this might look like. So it says you can't compel them to do a commercial course, but what if, what if a registered school says, okay, we are going to partner with this commercial um, bar prep course to create a last semester court class for our students so that they can get a jump on bar prep and it is a requirement for graduation. How does that fit with the, you can't compel them to go to a particular course. Um, and I would think in that case, there would be nothing to disclose because students would just be paying for it as another unit the same way they do any other class. And of course, teachers get paid to teach those classes. So I, I fear I'm just missing something. So if you could clarify, that would be great. Oh no, I'm, I'm happy to do so. Um, I think, and I'll, I'll be happy to share my thoughts, but of course, Dean Clancy can chime in. Um, I believe, and maybe the text didn't make that clear. Uh, we really thought about commercial review courses being like an external commercial review course, meaning, you know, you can't push the students to go take Barbary, you know, like if the student's going to take a commercial review course outside of your law school, um, you really should be giving them choices about doing that. Um, so I think we kept that language just understanding um, you know, uh, that you don't compel them or you don't solicit your students, you know, on behalf of a commercial bar 
provider um, to take their external bar review. I think, and I think that was inherently in the guideline before. So that's what I believe is still there. You make a great point though, about if you're requiring an external commercial review course, but I think maybe the, where the confusion is to me, if you're requiring the review course and it's something that has to be designed to your curricular standards, it's not an external commercial review course um, at that point. I mean, it, it, I, I find it very hard to believe, especially given um, what has to be in that course for attendance, 80% attendance and everything that you could just take a Barbie course, for example, that they offer externally and plop that into your program. I think there's a, a lot more that would have to be done by curriculum um, and other processes. Uh, and that wouldn't be a commercial review course. Uh, so I hope that explains. And then Dean Clancy, please feel free to chime in as well. But that was my understanding of it. No, I really want to say that I'm in favor of adding any language that would result in absolute, complete transparency, anything at all. So, so just to clarify then, so this, when you're referring to can't compel, solicit, attend any particular commercial review course, you're saying outside the school, not for credit, not, not for anything that is part of the curriculum. You're just saying we can't make students do some extra external review course. Or... I, I saw that as just following from what the guideline originally had, which I understood to be designed that way, right? The waiver was an exception, but yeah. how the original guideline uh, worked is, yes, a law school wouldn't be, um, when, when this commercial review course is external to the whole program, you wouldn't be necessarily, you shouldn't be compelling or soliciting. Sure, and I guess that, to me, that made sense when you couldn't give credit for those courses yes. and you didn't have them in your own school. So yes. the only That's choice right. was to say, oh, go someplace else, but you couldn't compel them where to go and you couldn't be lining your own pockets as a result. But if, if the rule is now, excuse me, the guideline is now saying, oh, you can offer this for credit and if the school so chooses, you can make it required, I think there might be it needs some you know more wordsmithing to do with that aspect of the language. I, I would I would I would agree with that. Yeah, maybe there mm -hmm. needs to be more definition to the commercial review course. Um, quick question for Dean Clancy. You you were suggesting that there be or one of the modalities you were talking about was a little bit of bar review every year. Um, uh, but I wonder is, do we have any understanding about whether it's better um, for the students to focus the bar review, say in their fourth year and in the first year when necessary, um, rather than spread it out? In other words, is the bar review in the 2L year going to be as helpful when they take the bar exam two or three years later? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm guessing that it could vary between schools depending upon the demographics of the, of the students involved. I would think that for some schools, they might want to have bar review occur every year. Maybe for other schools, they won't need it until the very end of, uh, of law study, to the, at the end of law school. But I think it ought to be left up to the schools. Okay, so it's a social science experiment to be conducted. To be conducted. Gotcha, thanks. Dean Keller, I don't know if you still have the question. I said the hand went up and then down. No, I, I was going to digress that, but, but as we're running low in time, um, I, will, I will pass. And any other questions or comments from our committee uh, to this team before our third and final team presents? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Ms. Leonard, if you could put up our red line for the Dean Deal group. Certainly. There you go.
If you don't mind, I've put it up in the version that has the other two as well, so you can move seamlessly through them. But this is the exact wording that you provided to me. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so our our focus for our team, and and you know, feel free to jump in any time you know as we go through, and you guys have your separate time at the end if you'd like. Uh, was focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, as all teams were, uh, but then also on licensure and professionalism. And I think one of the, the key takeaways from our review and our conversation was that the California bar exam as a licensure exam is designed to test that minimum skills in first year practice as being charged with the Blue Ribbon Commission, then there's perfect alignment between preparing for the bar exam and preparing for practice, right? if, if we accept what the charge is. So I think we took that as a given. Uh, on our version, in the original drafting, I was for having a requirement of a bar review. Uh, and there was pushback in our group as we went back and forth and talked about that. But just to explain some of the logic to that, again, for the registered schools, all registered school students must sit for and pass the first year law students exam as a requisite to earning their JD to then in turn qualify for the general bar exam. So that's a huge uh, difference between the ABA, the CALS and the registered schools. Thus, I look at the first year law students exam as part of the curriculum of all the registered schools. It, in essence, is a summative examination of the first year curriculum, contract sports and crim law, and is part of the curriculum of that course. So I would argue requirement, uh, but not to muddy the waters too much. And we try to go to the other side, right? The other side of the spectrum. Okay, well, if we're not gonna have a requirement, are we gonna have a maximum? Should there be a maximum? And that led us to our discussion on just a definitional approach to what a bar review would be. And that's our second paragraph under the red in, in the presentation. And we had a difficulty grappling with that as we did as a team, as we do it as a committee in this discussion right now, what is a, a bar review? So I think one point definitely was it's a review of materials previously covered, but that's often true in, in other subjects. You know, can you really study con law without studying some torts defamation issues? You know, can you study criminal procedure without studying con law? You know, these, these things are built into each other as they go through, and of course, the remedies analysis I discussed earlier. So we put a second point of comparison where not only is it the, the focused on previously covered materials, but also the unique particularity of the California bar exam itself. So I think that is a, a distinct element we can say is bar review. You know, the idea of standardized testing, MBE, performance tests, which are unique to the California bar exam. So I would argue those courses that have that as a defining element within their syllabus, they're focusing on the test taking skills as, a, as conducted by the California bar exam on either the first year law students exam or the general bar exam. That would be a, a definitional issue for me for a bar review as compared to academic support. And, and with having that as a basis, then I felt comfortable with having a limitation. And the limitation, I personally never reinvent the wheel. I try and find a similar concept that ex is existing and working well. So I went through our, the, the rules that we passed the past couple of years, I uh, went through the committee and they were approved specifically that if we're having some type of outside of class clinical program, clinical programs were reduced to 12.5% of a program, right, for clinicals. It was actually increased what it was historically because the argument being this is beneficial. So on the California accredited law school side, if we can award 12.5% of our program in a clinical form, I would say it would be a similar limitation for registered schools for the baby bar and the first year law students exam. And then it'll be up to them how they divide it up. And I would be a champion for having definitely a bar review for the first year law students exam after the completion of the first year and then probably one in their fourth year, you know, almost as a capstone course. And I think if we're looking just in pedagogical terms, that's what we're really looking at. Is this a capstone course for the general bar exam, which again is in alignment with the professional standards of minimum competency in the first year of practice of law. So that, that's where we came in from our conversation. Uh, Dean Lowe, would you like to add or differ on any of those points? Not much, Jay, but uh, you know, thank you for your effort to, to get this to the committee. Um, I, we agreed, and one of the points that we 
discussed and, and to Jay's credit, he agreed to um, adopt my vision that it, as the other teams, I think, is make it voluntary uh, with regard to offering uh, these kinds of courses for credit. Uh, we met and discussed uh, this issue with uh, a number of the other registered deans and you know some of the programs are quite small and uh, while they want uh, to have the, the freedom as they further develop and build out their curriculum uh, to um, offer such programs, uh, making this mandatory uh, anytime soon you know would actually likely pose a, a financial burden on them. Uh, they're the schools that uh, you know are able and uh, you know as many have historically um, will recommend their students take a commercial first year prep course or a bar review prep course. So um, I think almost by acclamation, we've agreed that, that the guidelines should be, should be um, prefaced or, or, or premised on a voluntary. Um, and with regard to the 12 and a half percent, you know, my new program, our new program here uh, is 80 units and that works out uh, well, it's 10% um, of what our, program would be for purposes of both covering a first year prep course and in a bar review course. Um, so um, I'm not necessarily in favor of a limitation, but there has to be one. I think uh, Jay's logic is impeccable with regard to the 12 and a half percent. So uh, with regard to that, and the only other thing uh, we didn't spend time, but I see the other teams did, you know, is to give schools again, the option to either uh, grow this out um, through uh, their uh, current faculty, a homegrown um, program, either for the first year or for the bar, or to rely on as, as many schools do a commercial bar prep. And as I think I indicated in the last meeting, I'm very proud, uh, I just did the numbers, you know, our, my students uh, in taking for three units, which currently in our current curriculum of a fixed facility um, credit hour is only 45 hours for three units of credit, uh, they're going to be putting in probably at least 100 hours, 40 of substantive time, um, you know, uh, another 16 or 18 with regard to test skills, uh, a full day mock exam. So um, it's quite comprehensive and it's all homegrown. My current faculty teaches it. Bar review, um, we're, we're relying upon uh, a, a commercial bar tutor who's working with, uh, with me right now to expand that. So again, for purposes of giving uh, a school such as mine or others, the option, um, I would hope the final version would would provide that opportunity to give schools the, the um, benefit of, of deciding whether to use um, an outside commercial um, provider or uh, homegrown or like I have a hybrid kind of uh, uh, scenario. So with that, again, Jay, thanks for your, uh, you know, your time and effort. And uh, uh, I think, uh, everyone appreciates uh, what everyone has put into this process. Oh, and, and I just have a quick question, and this is for staff. Uh, I'm really very impressed with all the time that the other teams put in doing this background uh, research in terms of what other schools, including ABA. And I, I certainly hope and would expect that all of this be submitted to the committee when Ever it like makes has a discussion because you know it's it is an educational process. It's been an educational process for I think for everybody on CSPARS to find out and to dig this deep and drill down this far what other schools are doing. And I think for the committee to make a reasoned you know really informed decision, um, all this information I think is essential to, for them to do that because I think honestly certain biases are there uh, with regard to what schools you know should be able to do or not be able to do. And, more information always is better. So I certainly hope that, that that's gonna happen. You'll probably be pleased to know that uh, this is generally forwarded to the committee, but also uh, the, the chair and vice chair generally also watch the CS bars meetings um, in preparation for their discussion to get the full material. Of course, Paul is in fact watching that now, uh, but the vice chair likely will as well. Thank you. Uh, just one thing I, I noticed for our group in the presented version, everything that's in red, those are deletions uh, from the original, except for the word may. So the, the wording in black is, is our proposed version. Uh, the wording in red is from the original 1.11 and it had a strike through, but on this version doesn't have the strike through for, from the law school through review course and the permitted and limited. Uh, Dean Keller. That was my question. I was, I thought you were 
keeping that first line of you can't make it a required course, which I uh, was very confused about. So thank you for that. That was very helpful. Um, I would just like to echo what was said. I, I would love to see the full memos that the other teams did, ideally, you know, before we talked about them, but um, however we, we do it, um, it would it would be great for us to be able to see that, not just for um, you know, next next level of folks to do it. But Jay already answered my question, thanks. We can share them and also post them to the CS bars agenda. Absolutely, this way the public can see them as well. Uh, Mr. Murphy, you're next. Uh, just a comment on the, the documents in front of us. Uh, as I'm not a dean, I've never been elevated to that exalted position. So strike that from the heading, please. Understood. Uh, dean Park. Uh just wanted to comment on uh, the work of the third subcommittee. Um, and just, uh, I think uh, that last paragraph was pretty interesting to me that, um, that there was a thought towards how to define bar review, which I know uh, really has been an ongoing theme through our discussions. Um, in terms of the data table I provide, um, I think I just would only ask that no one thinks that's comprehensive. That was really done under the time frames allowed, but um, it was so that we could feel like we could make those suggestions with some data. So just want to, uh, you know, I think if we do forward that on, I hope uh, they're aware about the time frame and kind of the purpose to which that was used. Um, I think the 12.5% is a very interesting point, and I can see how people would be familiar with that if they're already familiar with the rules and guidelines. So I just, I just think um, uh, all of us worked very hard on our proposals to have options, um, but I do like where things can be interpreted or where people can be more familiar with things. So thank you for that and explanation. Uh, Dean Keller? Yes, I'm sorry, real quick comment. I appreciate all of all the groups and very interesting, interested in this definition um, of what uh, a bar or, or first year law students exam course would be. Um, just to illustrate kind of where I get stuck at it in terms of why our, our group was found it very difficult to define. I mean, you mentioned remedies previously. So remedies definitely covers one. Uh, presumably you were thinking, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it wouldn't fit under two, except that if you're doing midterms and practice MBEs and essay questions, then it would fall under two. So now suddenly remedies, which I don't think most people would think of as a bar prep course, now is a bar prep course, unless you say it's not primarily focused on that, which is where the, to me, the issue comes in because I don't know what that means. Is that 50%? Is that 100%? Is it, is it the assessments are primarily focused on it or the content? Um, and so that's that just took us down sort of a rabbit hole and led us to, to say, this is really going to be too difficult to, you know, fairly and, and accurately and consistently implement. Absolutely. And where the rubber meets the road is that primarily focused, at least in our drafting interpretation. And that became our X integer fill in later of how can we define this? <laughs> I think if I might add one thing that could be helpful to note is that as we see more schools moving to an online format, we do see more of the integrated format that Dean Keller mentioned with even weekly uh, quizzes or MBE style questions uh, or even small essays integrated right into the courses as homework elements. So uh, the ability to parse out the bar review course may get more challenging uh, rather than less. Any other questions from our committee or comments from our committee on our third group? Hearing none, uh, Ms. Leonard, could you put that red line version back up just for a second? Or if you could bear with me just to see if we can have a, a, a agreement in principle. Uh, Dean Leal, I see you have your hand up. Well, real quick, back to the point I made earlier is it, this meeting obviously is going to run out of time, but you know, um, I wonder if the other members are interested in a discussion for 
definitional purposes of this uh, split between academic support uh, and um, bar prep, because if we're going to have a limit, uh, I think that's essential. But with, even without a limit, um, I think it would be helpful to schools to know what what would be considered which, and you know maybe that's the substance of another entire meeting and project potentially is exactly what I was just thinking. Uh, Dean Park, um, I was just I, I and don't let me rush anything, but I just I had a question more as to process. Um, uh, like Dean Keller said. You know, this is really our first exposure point, um, and we get to really share uh, back from our subcommittees together on uh, uh, what is here. You know, before this Friday CBE meeting, is there a need to vote on or like give indication? Of, okay, thank you. Um, will there be a point that we do that, or is it? Okay. May, may I refresh as to the timeline, Chair Fickberg? Please, thank you. Sure. Uh, so the charge from the committee was to bring back a recommendation at the August meeting, uh, which would mean that you would want to finalize your recommendation at the June meeting. So the introduction was in March. Uh, this was an opportunity to bring back research to begin drafting. Uh, you, you may, we, we may be able to develop a light consensus draft that I can post for you to think about in the meantime. Uh, to finalize at the June meeting. This is not on the CPE agenda this particular month. Uh, they won't be discussing this. They will expect that your discussion will uh, finalize at the next meeting. Got it. And so when we're suggesting forwarding the contents from our subcommittees, that's just an informational update, but it's not necessarily a weighed as anything more. Um, I'm sorry, I don't, to, I don't fully understand the question, but I, we do I intend to post the memos to the CS bars now, and then when submitting a full recommendation to the committee, uh, providing the committee with the process, including these materials. Oh, okay. And I see. So, um, so when we're talking about forwarding information from this meeting, it's, um, it's just informational. It's not it's not what you said, the, the recommendation point with all materials is later. Right, you'll have another meeting and, and rather in June would be the meeting when you would finalize your recommendation. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if we could have that red line up for just a couple of minutes. Certainly. I, I think the, the next step that would be helpful for everyone uh, will make sure that everyone has all of the materials that were submitted from all the teams. And my hope is, could we come up to a, an agreement in principle of the major focus points for the same teams to work again uh, between now and our next meeting? And then our next meeting in May, hopefully it might lead to a final draft version. Uh, if you could scroll down to the bottom to where it's blank, please. We're just a moment. Um, to this one? Yeah, if you could just go all the way to the, and start a new a new area, just a new line. I'd like to keep those up there, though. Uh, from what I've heard in our discussion, uh, point one, I think we can reach an area of agreement that needs to be discussed further is limitation. Should there be a limitation? So we just type, should there be a limitation? Uh, number two, transparency versus self-dealing. That's the, the comments I'm hearing back and forth. And then the third one, uh, definition of a bar review. Do those seem to be the same three friction points everyone else is hearing? And uh, especially committee member Kramer, would you agree on that? Is those the three focal points we would like to have further clarification on? Sorry, say it again. Uh, just making sure that we have an agreement on to what areas we should focus on as we could redraft again. Uh, one being, should there be a limitation credit cap? Two, transparency versus self-dealing. And then three, a definition of a bar review. Yeah, that sound like, sounds like the key issues. Okay, perfect. Uh, so what I would like to ask our teams again, if we can stay within the same teams, 
can we have each team after reviewing all the materials, hearing all the discussion we've had to do, which I think is an excellent conversation. Right? You know, I know I'm thinking of things differently than when we started here. Hopefully everyone is. And we can have another draft from each team directly addressing each of these three points. And we'll see if we can get closer. And then in our next meeting, we can then start the drafting process itself, I believe, and maybe even complete it that same day. Uh, Ms. Leonard, is there a good due date that you would recommend for us for that? Back to you. Uh, for, for the schools, you're largely completing your class periods. I would suggest uh, something that might be might coincide with that. Ideally, my, my thought is that the groups probably have a point of view, and I would encourage you to uh, make that point of view known in the month of April while it is still warm, and then I can um, assemble it and share it back to you. I think that if we go into May, the exam period, et cetera, it may be more challenging. Well, as an example, then with our group, is there, of the three submittals, is there one that we prefer as a starting point for the definition? We'll start at the bottom for the definition of our three submittals. Did one have a better starting point for a definition? Were it wasn't yours the only one that actually proposed a definition? I think so, but I didn't want to say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, I didn't mean to make that. It was not meant to be a judgmental. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, Ms. Leonard, if you can copy and paste the definition component uh, uh, right below number three from uh, Dean Leo and mine. Yeah. I think that was good. How about for our transparency? For our transparency, there was one that jumped out more. Possibly this, number one. Any other objection to that one? Or was we can grab that one for the- I think, yeah, it's answer. the one that's most specific about checking a disclosure. Okay, so let's grab that for transparency. Okay. And was there any one that stuck out to our group as to the, again, just as a starting point, right? As a starting point to say, we're, you know, hotter, colder as we're going through between the limitation credit cap. And I think we have no cap, 12, 4.5 for my memory of the, the three. Might I suggest that what I'm hearing is no cap, but if one is required, these may be some options and here's why. Okay, please. Does that reflect the thinking of the group? I believe so. Okay, and um, I'd I, just like I to I think check Dean with... raising his hand virtually and physically. <laughs> yeah, I just thought uh, in the consensus points, I think we should add the issue of, uh, you know, homegrown versus uh, um, uh, independent mm -hmm. uh, contractor, you know, commercial. I think that gives us an, an agreement in principle right now. Uh, uh, you were saying that it might not be as helpful if we have the group re review this again before our next meeting in May, just because of the workload on all the deans or? Oh, no, I, I, would, encourage, um, I would encourage a fast turnaround uh, because now the group has invested so much time to great, create excellent infrastructure that if I can provide to you this consensus draft, uh, you may be able to put together your comments very quickly while these thoughts are fresh in your mind. Uh, so I would suggest a, a due date, um, you know, even maybe a, a week or two weeks. With May 2nd, May 2nd, I personally find Mondays work well because then it gives me the weekend to, to focus on things. Probably not the, the best adaptive behavior for relationships, but it works well for working. <laughs> <laughs> Any objections for a May 2nd? a due date uh, addressing those components from our team. Hearing none. So we'll have a, a May 2nd due date then. May 2nd due date, that'll be uh, less than so a week in a couple of days. Okay. And um, I will endeavor to get a consensus draft to you no later than Tuesday, but perhaps much earlier. 
real quick, uh, Natalie, or is there, a, I, we saw so much today, does one of the teams already address the issue of the, uh, uh, the difference between commercial or in-house uh, programs? I, I, thought, I thought I saw some language. You, you might want to add that. I know that there was a disclosure element as to the commercial. It was only as to the disclosure. Okay, so we've got to come up with uh, new language there. Yeah, I, I think we actually did um, address it, saying it could be either one, as long as it fits under, you know, as long as the school provides the necessary oversight to ensure it meets with the rules and standards. Oh, yeah, there we, yeah. There, there. I think, yeah, that language. Uh, thank you, Dean Keller, for pointing that out. Now we're at 301 on the dot, so we're one minute past our posted time. Uh, now, Ms. Leonard, this hasn't happened since I've been chair. Yeah, we've been actually ending early. Are we allowed to go a little bit longer? Because I know there was one other point, the point F. Are we permitted we, to do that? Or? We can extend a bit. That is allowed under the bagley Keen rules. Um, and uh, fortunately, the last item is, is primarily an introductory proposal. So if everyone is willing to bear with us just for a few minutes, uh, it's to introduce the concept. We don't have to debate or discuss it at length. Uh, Ms. Leonard, would, would you like to explain uh, or would you like me to discuss the general principle? Sure, I'm happy to begin the discussion. Uh, what's the time commitment agreement that we have? We say 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Any objection? Oh, we got a lot of work done in the last 10 minutes. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so uh, so this is a referral from the Committee of Bar Examiners. It's uh, it's really more something to think about. The question on the table is, is the following. Um, recently, we've received some questions from uh, former graduates of several law schools since closed, and the custodians um, are no longer available to the students. The effect of that is that they cannot uh, prove up their study or in some cases their graduation if they fully completed the project. And this could prevent them from taking the bar exam, from practicing in another jurisdiction, from securing certain jobs. So it's a small number of students, but it could have a serious harm. And um, as a result, the committee asked for some study as to how to address this problem um, in theory, uh, and then what would be required in practice and what might it cost as well. Uh, in order to be sure that all students would be protected, all graduates would be protected, not only when their schools are open, but also when their schools close. Um, examples could be lodging uh, transcripts with a third party service, like an LSAC type service, could be a state bar solution, um, or others may be posed. Uh, so we need not decide today, uh, but this might be something to think about the issues, um, it, perhaps in your same teams of two. And I think, uh, Dean Frickberg, you had several issue areas that you wanted to propose. Exactly. Uh, and I think it's one that goes to the heart of all of our schools. We're our opportunity mission schools, and our students are the class that often leave and then come back, sometimes up to a decade later. So, you know, their records are critical for them, and they're more sensitive than I think most law students. Uh, but my thought process was to have three issues that I think we could help get the feedback on. Uh, one, should there be a provision at all to hand over records? And again, when I say records, permanent student file, transcript is the major issue as I understand it. So should there be a provision at all to hand over records? Two, what should the trigger for that be? At what point should the accreditor or the committee bar examiners for the registered schools should they force that turnover of records? What should the trigger cause for that be? And then third, who should the custodian of records be? And who should actually house those records once they're handed over? Uh, it's possible, Ms. Leonard, if we could have those three questions also given to the same teams uh, as they're looking at, they can start researching independently. And if they have feedback they would like to give, we can have a very robust conversation in our next meeting in May about that as well. I think it's something we'd all have a unique mindset in. Since so many of our schools have different accreditors, uh, registered BPPE is an example. You know, so I think we'll have a, a different way of looking. How do we, especially again, in the context of online schools now, you know, when it's a server, and it's much easier to hand over a digital record than it is a paper record <laughs> for the last half a century in the case of my school as an example. Any questions or comments on that? And so Mr. Murphy, your hand went up for a second. 
Oh, I, I just had comments to make, but I realized we're, this really is the time to discuss it. So I'll just wait. I, I would, I, one, one thing I'd say is those who might be familiar with federal regulations, they, they may have relating to student confidentiality records and the Department of Education has teach up plans, requirements, that sort of thing. There may be something in there uh, that gives guidance on what's permissible with respect to these records of, of uh, schools that have closed. Mm -hmm. De definitely FERPA, Department of Education. I, I think many of the schools that we're going to have this concern for, at least as I'm hearing, do not qualify for federal financial aid and thus may not fall within the purview of those federal restrictions. Oh, I, I, I realize that. Benchmark. Yeah, I, I realize that. I'm just thinking they may have an idea what, what happens to them. You know, I mean, and for example, in Montana, when a lawyer goes out of business or something dies, a sole practitioner, you know, we have a system for who takes over the files and how they're disposed of and it's a state bar obligation. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Dean Park. Um, thank you. Um, I think as for the, the trigger question, uh, I definitely think looking at, you know, school closure notification might be uh, a step um, and see um, how that is working or what might be worth benchmarking there. Um, I did notice that FEPI, uh, they do speak to school closure on a website and that seemed to apply to institutions, you know, even if you're exempt from FEPI normally. So that made me think, oh, maybe, you know, if you're talking about exploring options and what might take no resources or no cost, um, something that is already a standard, um, especially the, the thought that comes to mind for me, right? If you um, ask for a turnover of student records at some point, it's data security <laughs> and um, student privacy and how that can be protected to whatever state or federal standards that um, institution uh, should abide by or any entity should abide by. There's so much in that that would have to be evaluated for cost, I think, even planning for crisis mode. So that, that's actually why I refer to that BEPI benchmark. If there are some things already existing where someone's already taking that cost of, you know, identifying a third party system through which that information can be stored securely, that would be great. But if not, of course, continue to explore other options. But those were some things that came from mind. Definitely, and another uh, angle to think of this in our modern digital age of schools, you know, might it might be waiting too long for the school loses its registered or accredited status. It might have to happen earlier than that. You know, it might be just a server that's unplugged and then poof, records are gone, <laughs> which would be, you know, one of those things I would wake up as a nightmare <laughs> with all of our catastrophic backup plans. I still worry, <laughs> just as an example. Uh, and so I think that good news, I, I think that our, all of our teams did an excellent job today. Uh, bad news, you did such a good job. You're raising the bar of what we can do, right? <laughs> you're showing the, the great work that you're all capable of doing. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we can do something similar, you know, from our discussion, we definitely moved further down the field. I think we've had an excellent conversation today. I, I personally apologize for us going over time. I try never to do that. Uh, I think we covered all the points we needed to, Ms. Leonard. I believe so. And just to clarify, are you wanting to assign one of each of these questions to the teams, uh, either through having them volunteer or be voluntold? I was thinking each one could address, but if someone would like to volunteer to do them exclusively, each one, we could definitely assign it that way as we did in the past. Is okay. there a preference in our group? Um, okay, I'm not sure if you are wanting each to look at the three questions together or to divide between. Is there a preference for, I was thinking uh, from the dialogue we just had that each team could look at all three questions. Okay. Because it's more of a superficial, it's not a little deep dive. Uh, and I think that we can get a very good broad response of where we're going, unless there's any objection from our team. So then each, each team will have the, the first assignment of you know, going through our communal draft again of 1.11 and then addressing these three questions as it relates to the records for the registered schools. 
Okay. And what would be a good timing here for a return of initial thoughts? I don't think that one is as time sensitive. Uh, when is our next meeting date? It's in May. Uh, our next meeting date is in June, in mid June. Okay, June. So maybe by May 31st for that second group. So we separate them. Everyone, everyone can focus on 111, then their final exams, grades, and then transition back over to this for a little while and give them a break. And that will be the day after Memorial Day. So we would prefer May 27th, the Friday I, before? I just cite the timing and the group can decide what works best based on your schedules. Any objection to May 27th? That way you can have the Memorial Day weekend off. And I'm sorry, just to jump, are we expecting to write up a memo and have those actually circulated, or are you just saying not, not no, we should no, think no, about no. it by the 27th, which if just we're not turning anything it. in, doesn't really matter as long yeah. as we're ready for the June meeting. Think about it, uh, do whatever level of research you would like to, no memo requirement, uh, but try to address each of those three points uh, so that way we can then have those on the screen for our, our dialogue next time. So it sounds like May 27th, Friday then. So this is very much just brainstorming at this point. Mm -hmm. so any other points or questions for entertain a motion to adjourn? I'll move. Thank you, everyone. There we go. Sounds like everyone's ready to break. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Good to see you.